So um, I'm going to um, start off with our first speaker, and we're privileged to have here David Southwell, who's going to be talking um, from a, a very knowledgeable point of view for, about Hoopland, um, and he's going to give us a, 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 both an introduction to the session and also hopefully reflect a bit on archaeology and, and Hoopland from his own perspective, talking about the barrow is never empty, ghost soil excavations in Hoopland. So I'll pass you over to David. And, yeah, I think you just... Do the thing on the, to move the slides. Do the. And we're in, because there's a few people not here speaking, this, we're under no time pressure for talks, so I'm not going to get the two minute sign out unless you, you run to half an hour. I promise you, we'll not be running to half an hour. Um, hello, everybody. This is a. Wow. <laughs> you know, on my right, I don't usually get to be in rooms with uh, this big, with this many people. It's just usually me and the cat. <laughs> so, I stand before you, and I have to confess a secret. I am a practitioner of the dark arts. I am a practitioner of the dark arts of folk horror and the urban weird. For the last seven years, I have been practicing these dark arts in public through manifesting Hookland, a fictional lost county of England, a county which vanished under the reign of the Iron Witch, Margaret Thatcher, and her amendments to the Local Government Act. It has fallen down the cracks of our collective memory and now tends to manifest as ephemera, such as the Phoenix Guys to Strange England. The arrows maybe have Yeah. No, here we go. People go. Strange England. <laughs> A county by county park work given away at petrol stations in the weeks when they've run out of tumblers or smurfs. <laughs> Hookland is an open, shared universe to explore some of those connections between place and our sometimes forgotten myth circuits buried in the ghost soil. Mainly told through text and photographs on Twitter, it is a pre-charged landscape that hopefully gives a great jumping off point for others to use. So far, those others have certainly evolved it into some odd things, including mentions in New York <coughs> Times best-selling novels, numerous artworks and short stories, a classical music suite, role-playing games, and gothic electronica singles issued on cassette. It has been described as everything from psychogeography to hauntology, urban weird and folk horror. I'm pleased to say it has also been largely embraced and accepted by those communities. It has also, much to my absolute bonsbogman, become this session of tag. <laughs> and to my absolute delight, the county has also been embraced by many archaeologists. Before I can explain why this means so much to me, to explain the debt Hawkland owes to archaeology, I'm going to have to talk for a little while about what I call ghost soil, talk about the creation of Hawkland. As a practitioner, I am wary of genre definitions that work outwards or downwards from narrow selections of key works and the perceived linkage between them. I feel they often reduce the complexity of a work's formative process. They tend to place a primacy on formal structures ahead of the diverse actuality thematic concerns and the inspirations they are coming from. Many people call Hawkland folk horror. I just call it ghost saw. What does that mean? Well, I'm from Essex, a simple place, and therefore, as an Essex man, I like to keep things simple. Ghost saw is knowing that all horror is ultimately an unearthing. Ghost saw, to me, is an active infection of the past and place. It is an absolute refusal to use folklore and history as tinsel for a story, but recognise that those things are actually integral infrastructure, vectors of infection itself. Hookland, like most projects, is a resounding clash of agendas. It comes from a really deep desire to dissemble the idea of the chocolate box bucolic, to tackle the warping gravity of nostalgia, a desire to make it more difficult for the far right to attempt to seize the common ground of folklore itself, it comes from an intense dislike of creepy pasta that <laughs> erodes links between law and locality. It comes from a profound belief that enchantment, re-enchantment, is resistance. Nothing in Hookland is made up, just remembered differently. The county comes from deliberate acts of misremembering as a creative strategy. The county comes from a fractured, marginalised childhood of being shipped to disparate and often desperate bits of the English landscape. It comes from a childhood love of folklore and an adult understanding 
that is part of our conversation with our environment. That folklore is a way of seeing ourselves in the narratives of place. It is access to the psychic trapping of event embedded in the land. This is our line of transmission. This is our echo memory. It is fault line. Folklore is a narrative constantly cheating death by changing its jacket. Folklore is the liar that sometimes, just sometimes, tells the truth of soil and of place. That is a large part of what Hookland is about. I wanted a way to talk about that relationship between place <coughs> and story in a way that wasn't going to be dissected by theory so that all of the mystery died on the autopsy table, where I could connect to old, peculiar England without it being seen as ironic. Sometimes, no matter what a psychogeographer tells you, ghost means ghost. Authors really are talking about the spirits of place. Hookland was made by Soviet science fiction and cosmonauts. It was made by pulp novels my mother didn't want me to read, and bad films surreptitiously watched on an old black and white TV. It has been shaped by a refusal to sneer at the work of Stephen King, because Salem's Lot, when you read it at 11, is brilliant, and it still is. In fact, it has been shaped by a refusal to sneer at anything that generated a sense of sublime awe and terror in childhood. It has been made by brilliant writers, Aikman, Macken, Jackson, and it has been made by some really bad ones. <laughs> it owes large debts to comics, goth and punk, and movie soundtracks that it will never repay. Its substitute parents are free public libraries and Radio 4. It comes from a childhood place soaked with a fear of ghosts and UFOs. It comes from a place <coughs> of love for those exact same engines of horror. It comes from a revulsion of how psychogeography has increasingly become an academic and art language that works to exclude people from their own primate experience of landscape. It comes from a raging dislike of commodity nature writing. It comes from an absolute refusal to allow fascists to easily occupy their cherished grounds of myth and folklore. It comes from the cunning, the landscape of England, as experienced by this broken body for four long decades. Faye Godwin, Paul Nash and Dorothy Goward are always muttering about it with disapproval in the imagined afterlife. It was designed to be a permissive space, a common ground where people could explore and find their own hauntings. Anyone who wants to can own it. Anyone can make it. All those who do so are marching with the spirits of dead spacemen, wood sprites, and a thousand lost childhoods. They are all scuffing up their own memories, making their own stories as they navigate across the ghost soil of place. I really wanted to create a playground for myself and others. A playground with the vibrancy of a daydream. A dream space you occupy <coughs> in the hope that when you pulled yourself into waking, reality would be disrupted by it. A space where we could scratch at our souls and find that we were still animists, still addicted to a sense of mystery. A playground where the confines of hard reality knocked into us by educational establishments and the economy could be dumped for a while and new perspectives on landscape discovered. A playground where the barrow was never empty, but filled with treasure of temporal echoes, whites and phantom boars, where special deposits translated into door guardians, threshold watchers, Foundation deposits and post holes gave the direction to the goddess Hell's domain. Somewhere that lived up to everyone's childhood expectations of strangeness, even and sometimes especially when it came to archaeology. Somewhere that as you moved through it in your mind, as you explored the county, you knew the bone deep truth that the actual land holds you and your walking wake as phantoms of tomorrow to be recovered, to be misremembered, to be encountered and interpreted. In the true Essex style of keeping it simple, I suppose what I was trying to do was write about feelings of awe and wonder. I wanted to write about enchantment. And this is where archaeology comes in. For I cannot talk about how my landscape as a child was enchanted without talking about archaeology. Age seven, walking across the harrowed fields of the Salvation Army farm colony, actually it was really a work farm or work camp, to the ruins of Hadley Castle, which was my favourite playground, I found a stone arrowhead. Being a curious cat, I didn't just want my own opinion that it was a stone arrowhead, I wanted expert official confirmation. So I took it to the nearest museum, where I was told it was a possible Mesolithic object, and promptly bullied into giving up my ownership of it. 
all magic comes at a cost. All magic requires sacrifice. And on that day, from the loss of my find into the murky world of the 1970s Essex County Archaeology Service, I received enchantment. No longer was Hadley Castle just a place haunted by the ghost of Cunning Mull, by legends of black dogs and smugglers. Now the castle and the downs, where I played, where I walked, where I explored for clockless hours, were haunted by the temple shades of the Stone Age. With that interpretation of what I had found in the fields, I was granted passport to the imagined past, given ability to time travel, given a lens of awe and wonder through which to see my landscape. Four years later, I was in South End Central Museum. Possibly, I confess, in part of hope of seeing my find displayed. <laughs> when in a neglected cabinet, I came across some bronze Roman toys, a small centurion and a chariot. And on a scrap of paper that was beside them were these words associated with the excavation of a villa in Dawes Heath. This was a revelatory nexus point, a moment when past infected present, when enchanted vision was granted. I had to walk home from school through Dawes Heath, and forevermore, despite walking home in boots that leaked and gave into the snow, despite walking home with the heavy humiliation of bullying, the cigarette burns inflicted on you that you could never show to an adult, that walk through Dawes Heath now had magic to it. That's Hadley Castle. I travelled now in Dawes Heath in a continuity with long vanished children. I thought about Star Wars figures being discovered by future archaeologists. I thought about shared space, about spines through time itself. I walked not in my painful present, but in the fiction of a constructed past. I needed no Raiders of the Lost Ark romance to make archaeologists important figures to my imagination. I had already learned that they were enchanters. There are many reasons that I and other writers find an affinity with archaeologists, a certain kingship. It is not just that we share skills, data collection, synthesis, not just that we both professions interpret the land, tell its stories, not just because of our parallel experiences of working in near poverty on projects for years that are often totally ignored. I think that kinship comes from us both having an innate sense of the past as important, of having an understanding of the powerful gravity it has to walk the now. Both writers and archaeologists are constructing a reality of the past, dealing in constructed fictions. The kinship comes from a recognition of follow, fellow world builders, fellow enchanters. Archaeology is deep in the DNA of Auckland. Among the first notes I ever wrote on it were those detailing the number of barrows, RNA settlements and megaliths, how it houses the third best Roman fort north of the Alps, how its Saxon graves rivaled those of Berensfield and Swallowcliff. I did this because archaeology is always one of the best walls to bounce the idea of a story against, because archaeology helps me jump outside current paradigms. It is one of my most treasured roots to not only explore the continuity of human life, but the absolute alien nature of the past. I would argue that because folk horror and the urban weird deal with place, the past, and the law of the land, they are always going to be genres facing a political territory fought with issues of nationality, nostalgia, and a desire by certain right-wingers to own aspects of the Commonwealth of Imagination. In this, there is also kinship between writers and archaeologists. Authorship, control of the narrative, the truth unearthed. It all ends at the moment of publication. It all ends at the moment we press send. Our finds, our stories become feral. Control ends, but responsibility doesn't. In this age of misremembered schooling and bad TV documentaries, in this age of eroded primacy of fact, the past still has currency. The past is weaponized as legitimacy. The past is often made sinister and dangerous. This means I have to bounce my stories against the wall of archaeology responsibly. For even in imagined spaces, we have a duty to resist bad ideas. I realize that when using archaeology to build the world of Auckland, I am using a very powerful enchantment. I have to avoid the dangers of misinterpretation. Even when telling stories 
of antiquarians made too mad, or barrow rights, or spectral barrow prints, I feel a duty to try and respect the work of actual archaeologists. It is one thing to create a mythology based on the standing stones of Blackford Down, to talk of stellar calendars aligned to Cygnus, to hint that the psychopomp influence of swan finds in Witch Pit but may, through the misremembering of folklore, point back to the Neolithic. However, it is entirely another matter to bounce the wall of strange story against the evidence of archaeology and give succour to the numpty ideas of authoritarian nationalists. You know, to feed the fantasies of fascists with the ideas of political hegemony and give succour to the ideas that there was a cultural cohesiveness, even a sense that Britain was a thing in the New Stone Age. I have a responsibility to starve those pseudo-archaeologists with their ideas of a white father race of any comfortable crumbs when I am telling stories. Fiction will always weave itself around archaeology, and so the stories we tell of it matter. Hawkland is a place where even I, as a bear of little brains, can kick against the narratives that the Neolithic in Britain is just the Orkneys and Wiltshire. Hawkland is where I can point out the Stonehenge is boring, a black <laughs> hole that sucks in attention to some much more worthwhile stories, where my transformations of your data may offer narratives to defeat authenticity spirals, to poke fun at those with agendas of misinterpretation, because black shirts and red faces are never a good look. This afternoon fills me with hope, a rare commodity these days. I cannot praise Ken and Katie enough for this. In putting it together, this exploration of archaeology and fictional spaces, they are making the borders between disciplines dissolve into salt line blurs. They are giving, as I have tried to do with Hookland, new territory to walk together, giving permission to dig deep into the ghost soul and find wonders and awe. All I can say is more of this, please. Make us your ambassadors. Whenever you find a writer, an artist, a musician, a filmmaker, seduce them with your enchantments. Make our imaginings and manifestations of the past part of your outreach. I say this because data interpreted through the theory of fantasy can still be an important part of dealing with those who want to own the authority of the past for malarkey. The barrow is never empty. It is filled with stories. Help us to tell the ones you want. Help us to tell the ones that are needed. As we say in Hawkland, re-enchantment is resistance. <laughs>